Alright, good, morning. good morning. 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 Welcome to the small group we've got here today with a number of our folks are out uh, for travel and uh, illness and everything else. So I'm glad that you guys are here and that we can take a look at the Word together. Uh, we are going to move on from the fourth commandment, the Sabbath, to the fifth commandment today. We've, we've uh, I don't know if we've necessarily covered everything we could have about the Sabbath, but we've certainly covered more than I would have ever thought possible when I began this series. So uh, we're going to talk about the next commandment here. And we'll start actually by looking at Matthew chapter 22, a passage that I think most of us are very, very familiar with, where Jesus um, is questioned by the Pharisees who are trying, I guess, to, I don't know in this case whether they're trying to trip him up or whether they're just trying to, you know, ask him a question and see if they can get him to, you know, if he just doesn't know it or what the deal is exactly. But it says in chapter 22, verse starting at verse 34, that hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So he says, they ask him this question, and at least one of the Gospels, after he answers this, the teacher responds and says, Well said, teacher. So it's, it, that's why I said it's kind of interesting because uh, by this time, the Pharisees really don't like Jesus, so it doesn't seem like they throw him a softball, and yet somehow it seems like this question was one that they thought would be very perplexing to him, even though it seems so obvious to us at this point. Ian? I have a potentially silly question. By all means. What's the difference between a Sadducee and a Pharisee? Okay, so, okay. Uh, so the Sadducees were um, a, a party that had developed out of the Maccabean Revolution, um, that overthrew the Greek government that had taken over, uh, that had conquered J Jerusalem and Judea after the Jews had been allowed to go back to their homeland, had set up kind of their own government. Rome had lost its, no, sorry, this is before Rome. Um, uh, Persia had kind of lost its grip on them as they were replaced by the Greek Empire. And during that period of time, the Greeks came in and took over and set up um, a government with a, with a, and a, and a king who was particularly anti-Jew, uh, did a bunch of things that really angered a bunch of the Israel, the, the Jewish people. They overthrew him, set up their own government under a family called Judas Maccabeus and his descendants. Though uh, ultimately one of Judas Maccabeus' descendants set up himself as both high priest and king, which didn't last very long because it wasn't what God wanted, but eventually um, he lost that position, but the Sadducees became a political party that was affiliated with, initially with this Maccabean revolution, but in particular they became affiliated with the governor, governoring, governoring, that's not the right governing. word, governing, that's the word, there's one more syllable there that I need, governing um, party in Jerusalem and Judea, as well as with the temple and the power associated with the temple. So the Sadducees were referred to as being the heirs of King David, not literally in the sense that they were David's children or his descendants, but in the sense that they had inherited the power associated with the, the secular side of the government. So they were tied up with the temple worship and with the governing. The Pharisees developed later as a response in part to the Sadducees and to other excesses of the cut of the um, the ruling group and wealthy groups of Israelites and, and Jews who were not following the law very well, um, who they felt like were um, in many ways abusing the power that they had over the temple, and they grew, came up with the mindset of trying to reform, to make sure that the Israelites didn't go back to the kinds of things that they had done in the past, and it didn't end up getting themselves sent back to captivity or whatever else, and so eventually they, um, they, they became more and more prominent not initially because of being particularly wealthy, most of them were middle class, but because they were very good, they studied the law, they knew the law, and a lot of times when you see the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, or experts in the law, they're, they're, they're synonymous. Um, Pharisees oftentimes were the rabbis, and in particular what Pharisees did um, and asserted was that they sat in the seat of Moses. So the Sadducees would claim that they had inherited the authority of David, and the Sadducees or the Pharisees would respond and say, no, we sit in the seat of Moses, and we know the law. And Sylvia has been about to explode out of that her chair is, for a while. Uh, by Jesus' time, the Sadducees, the Sadducees, they had a lot of weight. 
But they were the group that did not believe in a resurrection. That is also true. The yes. Pharisee spirit. And so, but the last word, if something had to be decided, was on the Sadducees. Because the Sadducees controlled, well, Herod generally deferred to the Sadducees, and in general the Jews could not do anything without him, and the Sadducees made up a significant part of the Sanhedrin, as did the Pharisees, which made with the governing bodies. So, both of them are important. The Sadducees have less knowledge about the law than, than the Sad, sorry, yeah, than the Pharisees do, but they have a lot of, of secular power, and so when you look at if you look at Matthew 22, the question, uh, the issue that the Sadducees address with Jesus, I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I remember it. I, I don't want to say that before I'm sure. But let me see, 22. Uh, yeah. So the Sadducees came to him with the question about the resurrection, about the man who had multiple wives, where he married and, and or no, sorry, where the woman married a guy and he died and married another guy and he died and another guy and died and the question that they had was well in the resurrection who's who she married to and jesus gives the response that there's not um that there's no marriage at the resurrection and he also says but more fundamentally your question betrays i'm paraphrasing betrays your lack of understanding of the resurrection you're trying to fool me trick me into, into showing the resurrection isn't real that the resurrection is real and and, the, and so the pharisees and it's possible, now that I remember the this, this sequence, it's possible that the Pharisees came to him and threw this softball up in part because they were oftentimes in opposition to the Sadducees, and this was kind of a positive for them, so their response was to go and ask him a question that would kind of feed into what they would say. So I'm not 100% sure there's a lot of political stuff going on here, and some of this stuff we don't really understand today because the politics and, and the interactions were very much of the time. Um, to a certain extent, but uh, that's those are the two major dominant political parties, if you want to think of it that way, in, Ju in Judea at the time. Okay. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Didn't the Sadducees not believe in, res in the yes, resurrection? Yes, that's what Sylvia had just that, said. And, and angels, or something, something else that they didn't. I don't know about that. I don't remember that. There was, there was something in that verse that talks about. I can't. I think you. I can't remember what it was, but something, something else they did not believe in. That may be a different verse from the one I was oh, looking yeah. at here in Matthew 22, because it just yeah. says here the Sadducees say there's no, no resurrection. And there is one so. where it's very clear that they didn't believe in the, in the uh, resurrection. Right. Well, this one here actually yeah. says, who say there is no resurrection, yeah. when it refers to them. So that's that's true. Um, where, now, Jesus' response regarding marriage is that, that we, in, in, the, in the resurrection, there is no giving and, and taking in marriage. People are like the angels who are not married. So maybe that's why you're connecting. Yeah, I don't know. Just, I in, in any event, the the, uh, the idea um, of of what the what the Sadducees are doing is they're trying to prove or, or trying to to make a point about their their belief in the resurrection. I think it's interesting though at this point that that Jesus is seen as enough of an authority from the perspective of somebody at least that the Sadducees are coming and trying to prove their theology against him. You know, this is not the sort of thing that they would go around with every rabbi and do because most rabbis are pharisaical. So maybe that's why they came to him was because they knew that he was not exactly on good terms with the Pharisees either. But regardless, he doesn't make either side particularly happy by the time he's done here. But in the case of the Pharisees, at least this answer would have been the answer that they would have, uh, this one here would have been the one that they would have accepted as dispositive for all of their um, parsing and you know um, and, and trying to to make up their own rules and everything, they did recognize that the idea of loving God and loving one another was the was the, the core of the law, um, even if they didn't practice it very well. So, okay. So the reason we're doing this though is remember we're getting into the fifth commandment here. So when we talk about the ten commandments, oftentimes it is said or it is observed that the ten commandments appear to fall into two basic categories as set up by that that notion of the two great laws. That there is the category of love the Lord your God, and there's the category of love your neighbor. And obviously, before anybody says it, yes, I understand that if you're loving your neighbor, that's a reflection of loving God, and so technically all of them are love the Lord your God. But let's get past that, okay? <laughs> and act like grown-ups and not try to disprove the teacher just because you can play with words, and remember that the teacher is a lawyer, and he's better at playing with words than you are anyway. So um, in that context, then, Let's take a look and see. So as we go through and when we look at the Ten Commandments, most of them do break down pretty clearly into these categories. So we have, you shall have no other gods before me. 
We have, you shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now that one's a little bit tricky because obviously that one could go under either category to some extent. But the ways that we see it talked about in the scriptures on a number of cases where God says, you shall remember my Sabbath, my day of rest. It suggests very strongly that it is a matter of honoring God first and honoring, you know, and, and what's good for man kind of second, although Jesus makes the point that it is for the purpose of man as well. So, like I said, the Sabbath day is a little bit tricky. But then we get over into the other commands after that, and we have honor your father and mother, and that sure looks like that's about loving your neighbor. You shall not murder, that's definitely about loving your neighbor. Uh, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. Now, as, as I observed, all of these things on one level are commandments about God. Um, Joseph recognized this, David recognized this, others have recognized this as well, that sin, first and foremost, even when it seems to be against someone else, is sin against God. So we can never ignore that reality. But the Ten Commandments seem to lend themselves to this idea of focusing on first on honoring God and then flowing out of that, honoring and loving other people. But as we go through this, I want to take a look and kind of see um, where honor your father and mother may be a little bit squirrely when it comes to where we're going to, okay, we're going to put this in here and where it actually belongs. So, one of, so over in Ephesians, we see Paul talking about this concept, con concept in a New Testament context. He says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. It's interesting that he says that this is the first commandment with a promise. All the rest of the commandments up to that point, it just said, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. The, first, the, the, the command, honor your parents or your father and mother, is different. So we're going to talk about today the, the, the idea of a commandment that comes with a promise. So in Exodus chapter 20, it says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. So there's a promise there. If you honor your father and mother, your days will be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Now, what do you think that promise means? What does it mean when it says your days will be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you? Okay, so one possibility would be saying you're going to live longer. Okay, and that's definitely, I think, certainly historically that's been one of the, the assumptions or, or analyses of this, of this, is that's what it's saying. Is there any other potential interpretation or understanding of this promise. Jerry? All the way through the Old Testament, God talks about obeying Him and staying with His commandments, and you will stay in the land. Okay. And that, that I think, is, to me, that's what that's tied into. Okay. So that you'll stay, that that's one of the things that apparently caused problems with them and, and ended up being tossed out of that is out of uh, Canaan. Canaan. Okay, and I think that's right. I think both of these are true, but I think of the two of them when, when we talk about the the uh, what's the word I'm looking for the, the 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 overall picture, the big picture that this the Jerry's one is more the, the the point is what he's saying is if you as a nation honor your fathers and your mothers, then your days in the land will be prolonged. You will, you will survive, you will stay, you will continue to have success in the land of Canaan. And then I think the secondary meaning of this is that individually speaking, if you are obedient and you are obeying your father and mother, that your lifespan will be prolonged. And we'll see in a second here where, you know, in one respect, your lifespan can be real short if you don't honor your father and mother. We'll get to that, but yes. Well, couldn't it also mean, too, that when you do that, <coughs> you have God's well, you. You, Yes. Well, yes, and I think that's, that's part of, that ties into what Jerry is saying, and I think it ties into the larger, the larger concept, which is that this is, a, this is a matter of getting the blessing of God's favor when you do honor your father and your mother. So, okay, so when we talk about this, um, this concept of honoring your father and your mother, um, how do we see that reflected in the Jewish law and other places? Well, in Leviticus 19.3, it says, Every one of you shall reverence his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Now, that's an interesting word, reverence. What does the word reverence mean? Revere. Okay. So what does revere mean? Oh, look kindly upon. Okay, look kindly upon, Sylvia. It's also on, and, and I think also it said, if you honor your mother and father, 
Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. They were her whole clans together, not like today, when they were 18, they leave the house. That was not that way, like that. So if you did honor the older generation, you had a peaceful home. Later on, he said, it's better to live on, on the top of, of, of your roof in a corner than with a conniving wife or something, <laughs> you know? It's the peace. If you honor one another, you will have peace in your home. Okay. So there's an element of having peace in the household if you, since you're living with your extended family is the common the common situation. Even if you're not in the same household, you're almost certainly within the same very small community living together or living around each other. So a lack of reverence, a lack of honor is going to be reflected very quickly and it's going to be problematic very quickly. But what else, what do we use the word revere? What do, who do we usually use that word in conjunction with? With God, right? We, we talk about reverencing God or revering God. In fact, um, one of the things that, that the Church of Christ has long uh, held is that we shouldn't call anybody reverent because only God is reverent or is to be revered like that. And yet here, the term that's being used for fathers and mothers is the same kind of reverence that we would have for God. Not the same level, but it's a term that's very similar. So I think that's interesting. Now, on the other end of this, somebody who's really not revering their father and mother, in Exodus it says, he who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. He who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. So, so somebody who, like you said, this is about as far away from revering your parents as you can get when you're physically assaulting them or cursing them. Um, and cursing, you know, is to call down curses on somebody. We use the term now, and we use it in terms of, you know, just using bad words. But in this context, it's calling down curses on them. Both of those things are things that are worthy of death. So obviously your life will not be prolonged in the land the Lord your God has given you if you do those kinds of things because you're going to die young and stupid. So, um, so we, have, we have some basic principles here. And then we see over in Deuteronomy what happens if you have a child that just won't learn. And we see this, it says, If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him he will not even listen to them, then his father and mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of his hometown, which is where the elders generally hung out. They shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him to death. Wow, that escalated quickly, right? And you shall remove it, so you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all of Israel will hear of it and fear. And you bet they would. I mean, if you're somebody who's stubborn and rebellious, you're definitely not going to visit that town. So anyway, this, this is, I mean, this is a, this principle is one that we see on a number of occasions throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament. And so um, I'm making light of it to a certain extent only because it's so radically incompatible with our modern day view of the relationship between parents and children. Um, and, and I mean, I think in, our, in, a, in a modern context, this is obviously a, a behavior that would be unacceptable. I mean, beyond unacceptable. Even if you took, apart, took away the, the, the more extreme degree to which we've kind of fallen into, I think, disrepair when it comes to raising children, this would still be beyond the pale of what we would normally accept. But it speaks to a very different understanding of the relationship between parents and children. It speaks to a very different understanding or, or belief in terms of what people are expected to be able to do as part of a community. And, and so we see this idea that if you can't do what your parents tell you, if you will not be subject to correction, if you will not listen, then you, you're, the consequences, to, they want to get rid of you. And this seems really, really harsh until you realize that that here again, a lot of the promises that God gave the Israelites were contingent on their obedience, on them doing what they're supposed to, listening to the guidance of their parents, who are presumably telling them the right thing to do, who are obedient to what God wanted. And this kind of a person is the opposite of that. This kind of a person is destructive to that goal, particularly if they influence other people to do the same thing that they are. And so when we look at it in those contexts and the survival of the community, Depends on people being people that, that honor God and God their father, fathers and mothers and that sort of thing. Then the logic of getting rid of, so good of getting rid of somebody like that actually starts to make a lot more sense because you're protecting the community. I had Jerry's hand and then I've got Linda's hand. I, I was just thinking about a comment that's made in the New Testament about about children. How they are, until they reach 
majority age, they are no better than the servant. They are, they, they reckon they're, they, they have no rights basically until they become. True, although the context of that makes that a little bit of a hard, but that, that's, a, the principle is true in that, it, in that it, he's, Paul is referencing, this is how it works in the real world. Yeah. It isn't necessarily true with respect to the church, because, no. because Paul says it different, but you're right. Would back up yeah. what you're saying. He, he's here, making an observation, how, yeah. That, that until they did, I don't know what majority was at that, at that time. But when they became an adult, the relationship changed. They're no, they were no longer uh, considered as a servant. True. Although, how how far this goes, I don't know. Now it's interesting. That was all we think about the one of the things he notes here is that father and brother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of the city. That phrase suggests that they are capable of overpowering him, which would suggest probably that he's not necessarily a full grown man at that point because uh, depending on the situation full-grown man could probably pretty easily overpower his parents and so I, i've always know, wondered why they don't include the daughters in here <laughs> they want better control over them i guess or something. Anyway, linda go ahead i worked 42 years in early education my last 22 years i was awarded a contract with the department of ed and i had a and my our services were free to end eligible children and so we had families from all over the world I think one of the most pivotal learning experiences that I ever had was with some of my families from the Middle East mm. who had experienced firsthand honor killings. And with girls and with boys, based on this kind of principle, it was just beyond yeah. my imagination. In fact, one day when I experienced that with a, a young mother whose cousin had been killed in Jordan, I, after she left, you could have just spun me to point me in a direction. I had no idea how real that concept was. And as people have fled the Mideast, they have taken that um, practice with them. But it's based on almost like this. When you have someone who does something that, that is contrary to what the culture, the religion, the family, they have permission right. to eradicate them. And the problem... The problem with with bringing this into the modern world is the same problem we have with bringing you know the commandment, for example, to wipe out all the people in Canaan to the real to the modern world. A command from God in a given situation is a binding command. Taking a command from God and misapplying it to a different situation is not. And particularly when you've made up your God in the first place, you have an even bigger problem. But one of the problems that you have with the Islamic interpretation of this is that this would seem to put some pretty finite boundaries about it and put, you know, this is not just someone who did one thing they shouldn't have done. This is someone who has is living a life of behavior that they shouldn't have done, will not subject themselves to correction, will not change the way that they're going, and as a result, um, they're being killed for that. Um, the, a lot of the, the modern honor killings are not bounded in that way, and Islam does not always provide the same kind of boundaries in general, and so there's some real uh, problems with, with applying that today, but you're absolutely right. This is something that the cultures are quite serious about, and particularly the, the modern, or at least uh, not modern, but the Islamic cultures of some, com of some communities and some, some areas are definitely still serious about this. And I think had the Jews been more serious about um, following God's law themselves, this might have been a much more common practice. As a practical matter, we see that, that very quickly the Jews are not particularly interested in following God's law, whether they're the older ones or the younger ones, and so it starts to really not make much of a difference whether your kids are you know, doing the right thing or not. So, um, it, it's that, but that itself is most likely a reflection of the fact that the first couple of generations didn't really make much effort to keep their kids on a straighter path, and the result is, in, that we see in Judges, is that a generation grows up that doesn't know the Lord, and they just do whatever they want to, and it all falls apart. So, okay. So um, let's take a look at this again. So again, we have the Exodus. The Exodus. Honor your father and your mother. Honor is the term that's used there. The term is exactly the same. The word is exactly the same as the word that we see in Proverbs, where it says, "Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of your produce, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine." So, so here we have this idea, it's the, the terminology is the same, of, of showing honor to your father and mother, as it is that when you do things, when you, when you give as part of the tithe 
and more generally to the Lord, you're honoring the Lord. It's the same word that's being used in both cases. It's a similar parallel that we see over in Leviticus chapter 19. Every one of you shall reverence his father and mother, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. The term that's used there is actually the same um, Hebrew term as you shall fear the Lord your God. Now the translators chose, at least in the New American Standard Version, chose to substitute a word out for them because the meanings are essentially the same. But, um, and I'm also because it probably doesn't sound as good. Everyone of you shall fear his father and mother doesn't sound as nice as reverence. But the word means the same thing. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and cling to him. You shall swear by his name. In both cases, the, the term reverence or fear is interchangeable. It's the same word. The meaning is a spectrum of meaning. And so perhaps on the high end of the meaning, it's closer to fear with God. And on the low end, it's closer to reverence with your parents. The point is that the writers are using the same word. God is using the same word when he says how you treat your parents versus how you treat him. And there's, it's interesting that, those, that there's this connection that's made between these words. So I've always kind of looked at the concept of, you know, when it says honor, it doesn't always mean that you agree with what they do or what they say or their lifestyle. What if they're wretched people, all those kind of things. But what it is, is it's, to me, it's more of the concept that you can't serve two masters. You can't say, I honor God, but I dishonor my parents. Yeah. It's, it's incompatible. It's like you're trying to serve two masters there. Yes. And that's how I kind of view it. And, and I think when we, when the first part of what you said, that I don't, you don't necessarily have to agree with everything. Um, when we think about secular authority, you know, governmental authority. We don't have to agree with everything our government does. There's a difference between if our government is doing something or is, is imposing on us to do something that's wrong, there's a different situation there because as Christians we have a duty to respond to that or to refuse that or whatever. But the mere fact in and of itself that our president or our congressman or whatever may not do the things that we think that they should and we may not like them doesn't mean that we get to ignore their authority. And it doesn't mean that we get to disrespect them. I see people driving around with bumper stickers that say, you know, so-and-so is not my president or, you know, whatever it is. And I'm thinking, well, which country are you from then? Because he definitely is the president of this country. And it, what's interesting to me is no matter which side of the political spectrum you talk to, particularly as we become more polarized, whenever there's a Republican in office, you hear Democrats saying bad things about Republican. And whenever there's a Democrat in office, you hear Republicans saying bad things about the Democrat. And the truth or, or falseness of those things is irrelevant to the point that I'm making. Because what you see, what you hear, whenever that happens from the other side of the political spectrum is, well, you need to be respectful of him because he's our president. Well, apparently it only applies when it's the president who's on your side. You know, so for Republicans, they're saying that when Trump is president, you need to be respectful of Trump because he's our president. But they're the same ones that are saying all sorts of bad things about Joe Biden. Now, he's our president. Well, that's okay because he's wrong. Well, what is the principle then? Is the principle that it's okay to be disrespectful if they're wrong and you disagree with them, or is the principle that you're supposed to be respectful even if you don't agree with them because they're the president and they have this authority. And the scriptures, when it comes to our parents at least, fall in the camp that Steve is articulating, which is it's not okay to be disrespectful to your parents even if you disagree with them. Now, if they're having you or instructing you to do things that you know is wrong, Jesus makes it very clear that's when you walk away and you do what, what God wants. But when it comes to simply, I don't like the way that they do something with their money, or I don't like the decision they're making about where we're living or things like that. These are not things that you get to ignore your parents and do whatever you want to. There is a, a principle that says that you show respect for them. And even when you have to walk away from your parents, there's no need to be rude or disrespectful about doing it. There's, um, you know, there are ways to, to step away from somebody and be polite about it and try to say, you know, I, you know, this is why I'm doing this. It's not that, you know, not that I disrespect you, it's not that I hate you or anything like that, it's just that I can't do this and follow God at the same time. Jerry? I, I, I have found in the last 10 years that I honored my dad when he was alive more than I realized I did. Because in the last 10 years, when he hasn't been around, is when I really needed him. Hmm. You know, that, that kind of an idea, that's when I really needed to talk to him. You know, and he wasn't there to talk to. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I think sometimes we don't realize how much of an impact our parents have in our lives um, until we lose them. I, I don't have personal experience to drive that 
thought process, but I'll do Linda and then we'll go over to Sylvia. I think a very sad reality is the fact that we have a large percentage of children growing up in our society who have suffered severe abuse. And I think that the hardest thing for them, you know, you can, you have to learn forgiveness first and then try to honor, but it, that's a very, very pervasive and difficult um, reality. And I think as we interact with people in our society and families and, and children, um, and that's a real challenge. And having experience, I mean, you must experience that with the children that you're working with, yeah. the young adults that you're working with. No, they're still children. It, it's, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I mean, I, I've had a lot of experience with that, and. You know, it's, it is very difficult, and some people have a really hard time honoring someone or, or understanding that they have problems themselves, too. But I think that's something that we do need to keep in mind because it's there. That's true. And it's input simple for people who had a good background with their parents to say, honor your parents and, and not recognize, as I sometimes forget, a lot of people don't have those kind of experiences. And, and maybe don't even have a neutral experience. They have very negative experiences with their parents for a variety of reasons, a variety of kinds of abuse or just apathy. More, I see more apathy with the kids that I work with than I do abuse. It's just like their parents just aren't there really. And I think that's a type of abuse. It's just not one that has a quantifiable concept behind it. Well, and I think a, a, a prescription for that, of course, is when we're holy and we're praying, you know, it's. I think we're in a position to forgive more and just pray for that person. But you know, it's hard for, for children or teenagers when they yeah. don't have that experience to be able to do that. Yeah. But something that as we face that, because I think we do, we need to be very aware of. Yes, that's true. Sylvia. The thing is when you said with the politic side of things, you know, this president or this president. I do not, uh, it's not my president or what. But people never did uh, think about why those people are in charge. God did let it happen. Yes. And it has probably very much to do with us all, with this country, what everyone. He punished Israel. What makes people think? He doesn't punish America or France yeah. or whatever. Then there's, oh, it's not my government. No, 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 no. What did, how did you stand up before? Yeah. Before all these things happened. Yeah. God let it happen. I think, I think it is interesting that we, we make the same mistake with, with less justification than the, the, the Pharisees did, which is we are Abraham's descendants, therefore we're safe. We don't have to worry. And we think, you know, we are we are somehow the, the nation of God. We are, you know, we talk about Christian nation and those kinds of things. But in the scriptures, there's no, there's never any argument to be said that there's a that there is a a nation after you step out of the the first out of the the, the, the Jewish era into the Christian era. There's no argument to be made that God picks specific nations and says, you are now the chosen nation. He picks people. And he picks a kingdom, and if you're part of the kingdom, then you're part of the kingdom, but you're not. So there may be nations that have Christian tendencies, that have the majority or many people in them that believe in and practice Christianity, but there are no Christian nations. There are no most favored nations. There are nations that exist for a purpose, and that once that purpose is done, then their existence is contingent on their obedience. And I say that with absolute certainty, because we can see that in the scriptures, and it's not just about Israel, it's about Babylon, Assyria, um, Persia, you can go through a list, all of them, every single one of them. Rome, God says, I've got a purpose for you, and as long as you're doing that purpose, you're going to have power and you're going to have authority, even over my people in some cases. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was given authority to come in and conquer Israel. Then he decided to conquer Judea. God didn't like that so much, and it turned out really badly for him. But later on, Babylon was given the power to do it. Nebuchadnezzar came in and did that, and then Nebuchadnezzar got a little too full of himself, God didn't like that, he knocked him down. So the same thing happens over and over again. Nations are chosen to do things that God wants them to do. And when that task is done, they exist or they cease to exist for pretty much as long as they continue to honor God. And I think we need to be very careful as a nation because I can make a pretty good historical argument. This is not the time or the place for it or the time for it. 
But I can make a pretty good historical argument that our purpose as a nation may very well have been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then, then we better be real careful because God may not have a lot of use less for us just because some of us are Christians and we mm -hmm. like to think that the nation is Christian. So we have to be, I think, mindful that, about honoring God. And I think a big aspect of that comes from that honoring our parents. In the Israelites' case, it certainly did because of the commandment, pass on your knowledge to the next generation. Well, if the next generation won't listen to you, then there's a real problem there. And I think one of the things we do see over and over again, not just in our culture, but in other cultures, is that the, the morality and the ethical code of any particular nation tends to generate over generations. Not immediately necessarily, but successive generations tend to be, in our case we can see, successive generations tend to be less hardworking, they tend to be less spiritual, or that's not entirely true, they tend to be less um, dedicated to um, organized religion. That may or may not be a good thing, I, I, that's a different question, but they tend to be less um, careful about how they spend their money. They, you can go and look at a lot of things, and I'm not just talking about uh, religious things here, I'm talking about general um, habits that, that we generally attribute to people who are successful and to people who make good decisions in how to run their lives, you find that successive generations tend to be a little bit less rigorous about those, a little bit less rigorous, a little bit less, and gradually you have this degeneration. And generally there's some sort of resetting function. Um, it's, not, <laughs> it's not a pretty resetting function, as you might imagine, but when you look, Rome degenerated. Rome fell apart. It, 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 it had a, a brief kind of re... re uh, that's what I'm looking for here. Rebirth, when Christianity was uh, it really began to spread, and eventually it became a dominant religion, and then it became the state's religion, and from that point on it went downhill again, because once you turn you know, faith into God into what everybody has to do, the thing is, is corrupt from the inside. But it began to degenerate, and the, the, the government itself became more and more corrupt, and eventually the, the response that God sent was basically a series of disasters that caused the empire to break up, uh, finished off by the Mongols, basically. And so... Rome collapsed, and there was a massive period of, um, of, of loss of knowledge and culture and everything else across most of Western Europe. And we gradually rebuilt from that, and then you get, you know, increasing levels of corruption and power consolidation and everything else, and then you get the Black Plague in the Dark Ages. You know what I'm talking about? Reset then, man, 25% of the population is going, you're losing basically hundreds of years of science and technology, and you're starting all over again 150 years later. That's a pretty hard reset right there. My, my question to that is um, uh, just... Because just specifically, um, we can attribute the Black Plague to the lack of sanitation that the Romans had, right? Rome was sacked and the library at Alexandria was burned. So san the Romans, I mean, they had running water for crying out loud. So they were very sanitary, uh, relatively, speaking. relatively speaking, yes. But then we get into the Dark Ages and you have pestilence and all kinds of breeding ground for sicknesses to arise just running in the streets. My question is... Is that God directly, or speaking more to the Mongols, like as you mentioned, is that God directly punishing, or is that God sitting back and let humans do what humans do? That's I mean, both. If, if, I were, if I were capable of answering that, I would have some knowledge that would probably put me ahead of the average minister of my generation. The answer is no. So, so I think I think the answer to that is it's yes. It's unclear. I mean, that's, that's the short version. The lawyer answer is, I don't know. Um, actually, lawyers don't say, I don't know. They, they say there's a variety of possibilities. Um, but it's easy with Assyria and Babylon because God said, this is what I'm doing. Right. It's not as easy with those kinds of situations. But I guess what I would say is that, that when I see things like the flood, and to a much lesser extent, whether it's Assyria or Babylon or any of those different ones, when I see those things happening, and God is at least a part of the process, if not directly doing it. And one of the tricky parts with the Old Testament is the Old Testament, the Hebrews had an understanding of God that said that everything that happens happens because God made it happen. Right. So if you, if you, you know, if you bring that idea into the modern world, then they would say it absolutely is because God made it happen. For us, we tend to be a little bit more concerned about that because we like ideas like free will, and, you know, those kinds of things. And, um, the Israelites would have not necessarily had the same way of understanding free will as we did. Um, they still had the idea that if you did something wrong, it's your fault. But, 
But free will is a tricky concept for somebody who's never really thought about Plato and Aristotle and those kinds of philosophies. So what extent God directly caused those things versus God put in motion the, the cause and effect relationships that lead to those things happening, I'm not sure how clearly we can define it. But I guess I would say this, there are times in history where you see really, really bad empires and really, really bad groups of people have a lot of really, really bad things happen to them all at once. And it's sort of hard to believe sometimes that, that that's just the course of human events, you know? And again, wasn't it our argument? No, no, I, I'm, I'm not trying to argue. I'm trying to say this is, it's a great point. And, and I think when you look, for example, at, at three, if you look in the 20th century, we have three of the worst empires ever to exist, worst rulers ever to exist. And Hitler and the Nazis and Stalin and the, the, uh, the, the Soviets and Mao and the Chinese. And actually, I would put actually on the, on the same level with them, although smaller because of the scope of his rule, but Pol Pot in, in um, Cambodia. And you look at those, and in every single case, there are fortresses of nations and events mm -hmm. that stand up and prevent those things from working. And a lot of it is, is nations that do it, like the US and Great Britain and stuff. But in other cases, it's also circumstance and what appears to be coincidence that make things go the way they might not otherwise, or makes people make the wrong decisions. Hitler made two or three wrong decisions, and if he'd made different decisions, he probably would have conquered all of Europe. Uh, well, he did conquer all of Europe. He probably would still be, the Germans might still be in charge of all of Europe. Um, and, and you look at that and you say, you know, this happens on a number of different occasions where rulers make a slightly wrong decision, and it's the only thing that prevents them from becoming vastly powerful, or even more powerful than they would have been. In the case of Pol Pot, you have know, someone who's so bad, and this, this is a character, I, I, we don't talk about him much in history because he, he's so small compared to the scope of the things that the Nazis and the, and the Soviets did, but Pol Pot was probably the most evil dictator in history in terms of what he did to his own people. He's so bad that, that the communist Vietnamese had to go in and depose him. You know you're bad when a really, really bad bunch of people goes, we gotta get rid of this guy, he's nuts, you know? And so, so there, there are, in history, there are times where the bill comes due, and whatever the reason, whether it's God directly guiding people, or whether it's, you know, a, a, you know, a, a combination of human nature and, and just consequences, these things happen, and consequences come. But in particular with nations that think they're good, these things tend to happen as they become less good as they become more corrupt. And I think that's where America has the most to be wary because we are blithely ignorant of the fact that the choices that we're making in many cases are not somehow protected by our special status. Um, it's, a, it's a foolish man who thinks that because he's blessed, he is now immune to God's criticism. The opposite is true in the scriptures. The more God blesses you, the more he expects from you, not, not the other way around. So. So I think that that's kind of the lesson that we need to learn from some of this stuff. Um, and today we've got to stop the lesson because we are over time. We're going to pick up here and we're going to look in more detail at this idea of, of the link between the, you know, how, you, how your children honor your parents and how a nation honors God next week. So thank you guys for your participation. And let's take a break before, before services. Thank you, Ryan.